The Quiz Kids, brought to you by the makers of Alka-Seltzer and one-a-day brand vitamins. Groups of Hopi Indians can still be found in northern Arizona. Where would you find a tribe of Hope Indians? Question number one is out of the question box, and millions of minds from coast to coast are trying to beat our five little scholars to the answer. And here they are, the Quiz Kids. The desks are ready, the students are ready, the questions are ready, and so is the teacher. Here he is, our chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Bob Murphy, and hello, everyone. We have a distinguished guest today, the Honorable Wilhelm Morgenstern ambassador to the United States from Norway, and he has some very interesting news for all our Quiz Kid listeners. Right now, let's get roll call over so we can get the answer to that first question. Joel? I'm Joel Kupperman. I'm 10 years old and 6A in the Volta School in Chicago, Illinois. Bernard? I'm Bernard Griesel. I'm 13 years old and I'm a sophomore at Lakeview High. Naomi? I'm Naomi Bernard. I'm 13 years old and I'm a sophomore at Austin High. David? I am David Prohaska. I am nine years old in seventh grade at the Burns School, Chicago. And Robert. I'm Robert Burns. I'm six years old in the second grade at Jefferson School, Gary, Indiana. Well, good for you. That's talking right up. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see. Did you say seven years old, Robert? Yes. Oh, you did. Fine. Uh-huh. All right. That's what, that's what I thought you said. Now, let's see. Um, uh, whose hand was up first on this first question from Mrs. George F. Oaks of Winnetka, Illinois? Groups of Hopi Indians can still be found in northern Arizona. Where would you find a tribe of Hope Indians? Uh, Joel's hand was up first. Oh, well, that'd be the Cleveland Indians, and you find them in Cleveland because uh, he's one of the owners of the Cleveland Indians now. Who is uh, uh, Joel? Bob Hope. Bob Hope, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Of I, I doubt whether you would find them in Cleveland right at this moment. Yeah. They must be in their training quarters. Yeah, I that... think it's at Clearwater, Fo Florida. No, I think you'll find that. David? In Tucson, Arizona. Oh, that's right, Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> I almost fell off my chair when you gave me that. Uh, by the way, uh, tell me, let's see, uh, what position in the league did the Indians end up last uh, year? Was it uh, 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 Robert? Third. Mm, well, let's see. We have another hand up here, Joel. Six. Six. That is right. Uh-huh. Well, say, for sending in that question, uh, Mrs. Oaks gets a dandy Zenith Transoceanic portable radio with a long-life battery pack. Now, that's the reward, friends, for sending in a question that the quiz kids can answer. But if your question is used and the children miss it, Instead of the Zenith Portable, Alka-Seltzer gives you the beautiful big $250 Zenith radio phonograph combination. It's a handsome cabinet model with two FM bands, automatic record changer, and the Cobra Tone arm, which plays records a sensational new way. So address your questions to Quiz Kids Chicago. Now then, on to more questions... Burnett Schultz of Edgeley, North Dakota, has an interesting little game for you kiddies to try. I'll tell you. I'll spell the names of musical instruments using the vowels only. Wherever there's a consonant, I'll just say blank. For example, blank A, blank, blank O would be... Uh, Bernard? Piano. No, no. It would oh. be banjo. But, of course, that doesn't count because we haven't started. That was just the example I was going to give you. All right, try these. Blank I, A, blank O. Bernard? Piano. Piano. <laughs> that's it. That's right. All right, here's the second part. Blank, blank, you, blank. Joel? Ukulele? No. No? No. <laughs> it rather lends itself to ukulele, but that is not the answer. Blank, blank, you, blank. All right, now remember, wherever there's a consonant, I'm, I'm using the word blank. And, uh, of course, I'm giving you the vowel. Um, blank, blank, 
you blank. Oh, uh, Robert? Violin? No, not violin. No, sir. But that's a good try now, Robert. Yes, sir. That's what I call stringing right along with the, the chief quizzer. Naomi? Flute. No, no, no. Uh, Robert again. Guitar? <laughs> no, but I'll tell you, you keep on guessing and you'll get it in a minute now. Yeah. All right, Robert. Banjo? No, not banjo. <laughs> you got another guess? Once more, I'll give you another guess. Some musical instrument. Uh, David. Drum. Drum, that is it. <laughs> D-R-U-M. <laughs> I, I knew somebody's going to have to get along pretty fast there to, to, to beat uh, Robert to that drum there. That's all there was to it. All right, here's the last one now. Blank A, blank A, blank, blank, O, blank E. Now, no coaching. I hear a lot of whispering going on in the audience here. We mustn't give this away. All right, shall I give it to you again? Blank A, blank A, blank, blank, O, blank E. Now, it's a musical instrument. Uh, Bernard's hand went up and then came right down again. All right, Bernard. Saxophone? Saxophone, that is absolutely right. <laughs> you know, that was rather a difficult question, but it was a lot of fun. Now, here's a very iffy question from J.H. Deem of uh, Columbus, Ohio. If Harry Truman were Thomas Jefferson, who would Chief Justice Vinson be? Joe? I think he'd be John Marshall. That's right. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from 1801 to 1835. Now, if Maine were Minnesota, what would Augusta be? David? St. Paul. St. Paul, that's absolutely right. If half of five were three and a half, what would half of 20 be? Joel? Oh, uh, well, half of uh, five uh, would be seven-tenths of five, so half of 20 would be 14. 14, that's right. Well, say. <laughs> We're just going right along here and really gobbling up the questions today. <laughs> this question comes from Mrs. M. Gerhardt of Chicago. Can you kids think of three parts of a tree that could be used to describe a person? Three parts of a tree. Naomi? His bark is worse than his bite. That's a very and, good one. Oh, he puts me out on a limb. Yes, ah. Uh -huh. That's what happens to me quite frequently. And uh, um, frequent. I believe he works in the branch library. Branch library. Oh, I got it. Yes, sir. That's all right. Bernard? He has a heart of gold. He has a what? Heart of gold. Heart, heart of gold. Him. All right. Fine. David? Uh, he's always packing his trunk to go someplace. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the way the quiz kids lately. <laughs> now then, uh, uh, quiz kids, take a little time out while we put Bob Murphy and our sound man to work. Listen to it fizz. It doesn't take a quiz kid to recognize that sound effect. You folks at home know it's the sound of Alka-Seltzer merrily fizzing away in a glass of water. It's the sound of comfort, quick comfort, when you need relief from a pesky headache or from occasional acid indigestion, or when your muscles are aching after a tough day's work. Yes, Alka-Seltzer offers you comfort, quick comfort. And listen, that fizzing you heard is the very reason Alka-Seltzer's relief is so fast. Because of Alka-Seltzer's effervescence, it gets to the pain zone faster and is thus ready to bring you relief faster than similar pain relievers taken in other forms. Make no mistake about it, there is nothing quite like Alka-Seltzer. You can get Alka-Seltzer at all drugstores in either the 30 or 60 cent size. Just remember, it's Alka-Seltzer you want. Now here we go, back to school. Well, children, this question is from David Mallett of Westerville, Ohio. If you resembled the fat lady in the circus, you could reduce your weight merely by moving to what planets of the solar system? Joel? The moon, where your weight's one-sixth of it. Uh, so say if you weigh, uh, say... Well, now, wait a minute, Joel. The moon is not a planet. I said planet. What planets of the solar system? Robert? <laughs> no, son. <laughs> uh, Naomi? Well, I don't know if you reduce your weight, but if you go to Venus, they might have some beauty uh, operators, and I think they could take pretty good care of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pretty cute question, and uh, incidentally... Uh, wait a minute. Do we have another hand up before I give this away. Uh, were you going to say something, David? I was thinking 
or something, but uh, I, I was sort of mixed up. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, it's, well, not to speak when you're in mixed-up form. Uh, Bernard? Well, wouldn't any planet that's smaller than Earth uh, have a smaller uh, gravity, so then they'd, we'd be smaller on any planet that's smaller than Earth? That's we right. Didn't... That's absolutely right. <laughs> and, uh... Uh, Naomi, Naomi gave us one of those, uh, a Venus. All right, if you looked like the thin man in the circus, to what planets would you go to gain weight, Bernard? Planets that are larger <laughs> than <That's>... Earth. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very obvious. Can you name one or more? Well, uh... I think Saturn and Uranus and Pluto are all bigger than Earth. Well, all you, uh, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and, uh, David... Jupiter, that's the largest one. Jupiter, and uh, then there's one more. And uh, All right, David. Neptune. Neptune, that's right. Uh huh. You know, uh, we intended to hire a professional actress for this question, then decided instead to use our own quiz kid, eight-year-old Naomi Cooks. We thought that if Naomi was good enough to star dramatically on Fred Allen's program, as she did last Sunday, she's good enough for us. So Naomi will help us on this question from Mrs. Clara Burton of Miami, Florida. Naomi will play the part of the little girl in three well-known books. You identify the book from which the speech was taken. Now, you must get two out of three, and here's the first one. But, Al, I just wanted to ask you, Miss Sally, she's been such a rich young lady, and she's been waited on, hand and foot, and what will she do now, Mum, without no mind? If, if, oh, please, would you let me wait on her after I've done my pots and kittles? Oh, poor little Miss Sally, Mum, that was called a princess. Naomi Bernard? That was taken from a book by Frances Hogson Burnett, and it's called uh, The Little Princess. And this character, I think her name is Becky. She, I'm not quite sure of her name, but she's a kitchen maid, and she wants to wait on Sarah after she's been put up in the attic. That's it, Naomi. That's right. Good. That's fine. All right, now let's have the next one, uh, Naomi Cooks. Peter... Uh, are you expecting me to fly away with you? I can't come. I have forgotten how to fly. I will turn up the light, and then you can see for yourself. I grew up long ago. David? Wouldn't that be Peter Pan? Mm, well, but Wendy uh... and Peter, that... That's right, Peter and Wendy, and that was Wendy speaking to Peter Pan. And uh, now here's the last one. How can you be such a silly thing as to sit there telling such stories? I'll make Jip bite you. I declare, I'll make Jip bite you if you are so ridiculous. Bernard? Is that from one of the Penrod books? No. No. Um, did you give up on this one? There's a dog, uh, something about I'll make Jip bite you, uh... That's a clue right there. That's from... Uh, do you give up on that? Naomi, do you want to tell them the name of the book? David Copperfield. Yeah. <laughs> well, I only asked for two out of three, and you gave me two out of three, so that takes care of that question. I think we ought to give a nice round of applause to our little actress, Naomi Cook. Thank you very much, Naomi Cooks. W.K. McLaughlin of Chicago is trying to size up the approaching baseball season and wants some honest opinions. What team do you think has gained the greatest advantage from changes in managers since last season? Well, now little Robert has his hand up. All right, Robert. The White Sox, because uh, Ted Lyons uh, was uh, always a winner... Uh, even when the White Sox were losing team. Well, yes, that's that's right, Robert. That's a good starter off. For now, let's see if we can... Uh, David? Well, I think the Cardinals, they got Eddie Dyer. While they had... I forget the name of the other manager. They, they had... Uh, I forget his name, but they won a World Series, and then they dropped down and weren't in it. And then they got Dyer in the season, and they got up to win the World Series Well, again. now, wait a minute. When did uh, Dyer become manager of the Cardinals, David? The start of last season, I believe. Well, of course, we're, we're talking uh, in terms of uh, since last season, see? As a matter of fact, Ted Lyons, I understand, uh, became manager uh, during last uh, season, during some time. Isn't that right? Uh, one of you kids can probably... Uh, uh, Joel? 
Uh, well, he became manager in last uh, season, so the only change, uh, two changes uh, this year uh, was at Cincinnati, where Johnny Noon's now coaching instead of uh, Bill McKechnie, and uh, Bill McKechnie was a good coach, and I don't know much about Johnny Noon, but uh, at New York, uh, where Johnny Noon was only a temporary coach, uh, and uh, now they got this uh, good Good uh, manager, Harris. Well, what's Bucky his first Harris name? Bucky Harris. Uh -huh. Bucky Harris, and he's managed the Senators to many pennants, and if he can manage the Senators to a lot of pennants, he ought to do it with the Yankees. Uh-huh. Well, it sounds logical. Mm -hmm. Well, are we through with this? All right, we'll go on to other questions. Now, this question here about brothers and sisters in the Bible comes from a brother and sister, little John and Patsy Rice of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Get two out of three kids. Who were the sisters of these brothers? The first one, Lazarus. Bernard? Mary and Martha. That's right. Next one, Absalom. Naomi? Well, Tamar was a sister of Absalom, or half-sister. That's right. And uh, Moses? Joel? Miriam. Miriam, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Gerald E. Porter of Brooklyn, Wisconsin, wonders what you kids can do with this question, and <laughs> so do I. Try to get two out of three on this. Admiral Byrd is making his present explorations during the administration of President Truman. Now, can you name the rulers under whom these explorers sailed? The first one is LaSalle. All right. Uh, Joel? I think it was Louis XIV of France. Louis XIV, that's correct. And uh, how about the next one? Uh, Vasco da Gama. Naomi? Uh, he was under England. I think it was John. No, no, no. Uh, Bernard? Prince Henry the Navigator? No, I'm sorry, Joel. Well, uh, his voyage was starting uh, being uh, fitted out under John, but he sailed under Emmanuel. That's right, King Emmanuel I of Portugal. <laughs> and uh, how about Robert Edwin Peary when he discovered the North Pole? Joel? Under Teddy Roosevelt. No, I'm sorry. No? Naomi? Well, that was in 1852, I believe. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. Uh, Bernard? Is it McKinley? No, and I'm afraid you children are guessing on this. David? Could it be Hoover? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid you're guessing. I know you're guessing. Uh, Joel? William Howard Taft. That is absolutely right. William Howard Taft. <laughs> Said Joel very emphatically. <laughs> Mr. C.L. Hansen of Round Lake, Illinois, wants you kids to spell names by using chemical symbols. First, the name of what state capital can you spell with these chemical symbols? Gold, sulfur, titanium, nitrogen. David? Austin, Texas. And how do you arrive at that? Gold, we'll start with gold, the symbol for gold. I think I'm a little wrong. It would be Augusta. No, no now, wait a minute. You're on the right track. Gold, what's the symbol of gold? A-G-A-U. A-U, A-U, and sulfur? S. S, titanium? T-I. T-I, nitrogen? N. That spells Austin. You were right. <laughs> Capital T. What, uh, what state capital would this spell? Sulfur? Argon? Nitrogen, tantalum, iron. What state capital? David? Santa Fe. Santa Fe. All right, let's see. You get the uh, symbols now. Uh, sulfur? S. S. Argon? A. A. Nitrogen? N. N. Tantalum? T-A. T-A, that's Santa. And iron? F-E. That's right, Santa Fe. Ha-ha. <laughs> hey, that was all right. Now I have a dandy question coming up next, and I think you kids should uh, catch your breath for it. So, uh, Robert, let's have a commercial. Okay, Joseph. Friends, I mentioned several discomforts before for which Alka-Seltzer offers speedy relief. Occasional headaches, acid indigestion, and painful muscles. But there's another problem we're concerned about right now, and that's the common cold. Colds are especially prevalent during March when their thermometer is capricious and the wet, slushy pavements make things easy for old man Cole to catch up with you. So, with one eye on the calendar, we're going to run through the Alka-Seltzer ABC Cold Comfort Treatment for you. 
A? Alka-Seltzer. Take it to ease up the headache and ache all over feeling. B? Be careful. Get extra rest, watch your diet, and be sure you're warmly dressed. Beware of drafts and overheated rooms. And C? See how quickly an Alka-Seltzer gargle can comfort your throat if the cold has it sore and raspy. Just make a soothing gargle using two Alka-Seltzer tablets in a half a glass full of warm water. That's our pleasant, helpful Alka-Seltzer ABC cold comfort treatment. Easy as ABC to follow. As soon as you begin to sneeze... Start Alka-Seltzer's ABCs. Now, Bob, let's hear Professor Joe and see what else the quiz kids know. Well, kids, this question from D.A. Newman of Chicago... And uh, our studio organist will play parts of three compositions. If the composer had written words to these numbers in his native language, what language would he have used? Now listen to the first. Bernard? I'm not sure. Isn't that Tchaikovsky? Uh, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. You've got to give me the name of the selection. All right, Naomi. That's the dance of the flowers from the Nutcracker Suite by Peter. It's Tchaikovsky, and that would be Russian. That's right. Uh Uh-huh. It's the uh, waltz of the flowers. Uh Uh-huh. All right, let's listen to the next one. Bernard? That's Claire de Lune by Debussy, and that's French. French, Uh uh-huh. And uh, here's the last one. Naomi? That's Anitra's Dance from the Peergin Suite by um, Edward Grieg, and that would be Norwegian. Norwegian, that's right. <laughs> and uh, Ambassador Morgenstern, the composer Edward Grieg, is just one of the many of your countrymen of whom the whole world is proud. Now, uh, Mrs. Amelia Bamerlin of Norwood, Ohio has a little test on transposing letters that everybody can get in on. We start with the word post, P-O-S-T. Now then, kids, see if you can rearrange the letters to make a word meaning a stain. Bernard? Spot. Spot, S-P-O-T. Now, a word meaning the upper parts of anything. Bernard? Tops. Tops, T-O-P-S. Kitchen utensils. Bernard? Pots. Pots, P-O-T-S. Ah, something that most people wish would happen to a filibuster. Bernard? Stop. S-T-O-P, correct. (laughs) Say, that certainly went quick, didn't it? Now, Mrs. Ada Newman-Smith of Tompkinsville, Kentucky, wants us to delve into a little poetry. To whom does the word they refer to in each of the following poetic quotations? They dined on mints and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. David? The owl and the pussycat. <laughs> That's right, son. That's correct. Now, they wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. Naomi? That, I believe, is from the, uh, car- the, uh, way- the Walrus and the Carpenter by Edward Lear. By, uh, no, no, no. Uh, you're right in the first part there, the Walrus and the Carpenter, Joel. By Lewis Carroll, it's from Elsa in Wonderland. That's right, uh-huh, <laughs> very good. Now, let's see what we have ne- here. Oh, say, here's a dandy. Family reunions are popular affairs, and Donald Harrington of Akron, Ohio, thinks that birds uh, might like them, too. So, if a cassowary <laughs> decided to hold a family reunion, what other birds of the same family might he invite? Bernard? Well, an ostrich and an emu, I believe. Emu, ostrich, uh uh-huh. Can you think of any others? Is it a keola or one of those in the family? No. not a keola. Uh, David? Would he invite a hawk or a kite? No, no, he wouldn't. uh, No, because they don't belong to his family. Uh, We're (laughs) we're speaking in terms of the family reunion. Well, there's the rhea and the kiwi bird. And, of course, it used to be the moa, but the moa is now extinct of course, he would like to be there, I presume, for the reunion, but he would have to send his regrets. Oh, dear. Well, <laughs> you uh, all heard the bell, and that means question time is over. So, quiz kids, take a bow for a very lively school session. <laughs> yeah.
Each one of you gets a $100 savings bond from the makers of Alka-Seltzer for trying so hard today. And now judges get busy and add up those points so we'll know which quiz kids come back to school next week. Well, here's that big news I spoke about earlier. The Quiz Kids program, which has been a part of the American scene for seven years, has now reached out to include the children of another country of our world community, Norway. We hope that it is just the beginning that the Quiz Kids program will find its way to many countries around the globe, knitting the world's children together in a common bond of respect and fellowship before the dread diseases of prejudice can build artificial barriers among them. The Norwegian Quiz Kids program originating in Oslo uses Norwegian children and is broadcast in another language, but it has exactly the same spirit as our American program. To tell you more about this experiment in world cooperation among children, we are privileged to introduce the Honorable Wilhelm Morgenstern, Ambassador to the United States from Norway. It's a pleasure to have you on our program, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Kelly and everybody, and greetings to the American Chris Kids. It may be a little hard for Americans to realize what the Chris Kids program in Norway means. The studios from which the broadcasts I made were occupied not long ago by the Nazis and were utilized to broadcast the propaganda of hate and conquest. Remember, that was a time when free Norwegians were brothers in arms with the American people. Now, five eager young Norwegian children sit at those same microphones answering questions, just as you American children did today. A ten-year-old boy, Ivar Nestos, has become as well-known in Norway as Joel Kepperman is in the United States. The response to the program was immediate. And in behalf of our Norwegian broadcasting system, I wish to express our appreciation to the Quiz Kids management for suggesting the program and for its great help in getting us started. Plans now are being discussed between the two programs to effect an exchange of children and it is hoped that next summer a Norwegian quiz kid can appear on this American program while one of your youngsters, Mr. Kelly, visits our country. It's a fine thing for world democracy in keeping with the spirit of the United Nations. Perhaps the quiz kids can help bring the world's children together in tolerance and understanding and thus cement friendly and open relations between the nations of our world. On behalf of Norway, I'm happy to salute the children of our great sister democracy. Thank you, Ambassador Morgenstern. An international quiz kids program is a great adventure in better world citizenship, and we are happy to have this opportunity of trying it. Now then, I know that everyone, especially the quiz kids, is anxious to know how today's report card came out. The judges say that as an entire class, we missed uh, no questions. David, Joel, and uh, Bernard all tied for first. Completing the board next week will be Pat and Mike. Pat Conlon, age nine, and Mike Mullen, age nine, in honor of St. Patrick's Day. This is Joe Kelly dismissing the Quiz Kids class until the same time next week. Goodbye, kids. Bye, Bye Mr. Mr. Kelly. Kelly. Listen to the Quiz Kids every Sunday, and don't miss the Saturday Night Roundup starring Roy Rogers over most of these NBC stations. Now, if you'd save yourself some trouble, buy Alka-Seltzer by the double. An extra package on the side keeps a household well supplied. This is Bob Murphy speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.